Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio from... Glens Ferry, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Today's program is brought to you by the support of our Patreon supporters who voted to do the Summer of Angela Lansbury. And you can become one of our Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net for as little as $2 per month. Well, we're going to go ahead and take a listen to the NBC University Theater. And uh, this program originally aired November the 14th of 1948. And the title is Of Human Bondage. This is the NBC University Theater, presenting the eighth in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works in modern Anglo-American fiction. Today, with Brian Ahern and Angela Lansbury as our stars, and with Clifton Fadiman as our intermission commentator, we present Somerset Moms of Human Bondage. Before the turn of the century, Blackstable Village, England. The vicarage sits at the fork of Tecanbury Road, a small cottage new when Victoria first wore the crown. The garden is neat, the hedges trimmed, and a single tall tree towers over the house. The door knocker is draped in black crepe. The blinds are drawn. Now the front gate opens, and the vicar comes up the path. The young man who follows walks slowly and haltingly. He drags his foot behind him in a clumsy, rolling limp. A sad, clubbed, twisted foot, clad in a misshapen boot. The vicarage door is open now, and the two men go inside. Cold! All right, Uncle. Cold, cold, Philip. But I promised your poor Aunt Louisa I would never let anyone else bury her. (laughs) Well, there'll be a hot tea soon. Yeah, let me take your coat, Uncle. Things have changed since I was a curate. In my day, mourners were given a square uh, black silk for their hats. Poor Louisa used to make the silk into dresses. She used to say 12 funerals gave her a new dress. Uh, Oh, oh, Philip. Yes, Uncle? uh, The cigarette. Uh, Please put it out. It wouldn't be quite respectful. Well, come into tea. There were 24 wreaths, you know. Mm, I didn't count them. Uh, Mrs. Rawlinson had 32 when she died, but I expect there'll be some others in the morning. Uh, Well, sit down. Ah, tea. Uh, Philip, you shall have the top of my egg as you did when you were a boy, eh? Mm, I used to look forward to the tops of your eggs. You did? I suppose you'll spend the next few weeks with me here. That'll suit me very well. And you'll go back to Paris in September? Uh, No, no. No, but I... I've decided to chuck it. I'm giving up painting. What? I shan't go back to art school. I don't think there's much object in being a second-rate painter, and I shouldn't be anything else. You surprise me, Philip. When you begged me to send you to Paris, you were sure you were a genius. (laughs) I was mistaken. It seems to me that what you lack is perseverance. Oh, please, Uncle. It's been that way since you were a child. When your poor mother died, Louisa and I took you in, hoping you would eventually take holy orders. But first you insisted on being a chartered accountant. And then when you tired of that, it was painting in Paris. Now, if you change your mind again, it points to... I know. Irresolution, incompetence, want of foresight, and lack of determination. Well, your financial matters are your own affair now. But I think you should remember your money will not last forever. And with your unlucky deformity, it will not be exactly easy to make a living. Yes, yes, Uncle. I've found that when people are particularly angry with me, they always manage to mention my foot. Well, 
At any rate, you must agree I was right when I objected to your junket to Paris. Oh, I don't know. I dare say one has to make his own mistakes. And it wasn't wasted time, you know. It wasn't. Well, I learned to look at hens and houses and trees against the sky. And I learned that shadows are not black but colored. Nonsense. The most suitable thing you could do now is to follow your father's profession. Medicine. Oddly enough, that's what I intend. I've already written to St. Luke's in London, and they inform me that I qualify for the medical school. I start in September, Uncle. I shall be studying anatomy with a, a scalpel in place of a brush. <laughs> September. I say there, are you a new man? What? Oh, yes. My name's Griffiths, Harry Griffiths. Oh, I'm Philip Carey. Phew. Oh, Oh, you'll soon get used to that smell. The whole hospital picks it up. I believe you're marked down with me for the same body. I'm afraid I don't know much about this. Oh, don't worry, I do. Well, might as well get started. I'm going in for surgery. You? Uh, Just the general course. I say, you're rather a dab at this. I've done a good deal of secting before. I say, don't cut that artery. It doesn't seem to be in the in the normal place. I... They never are. That's why it's called normal. Well, when we're when we're through with this, how about tea? Hmm? Well, I... don't let the laboratory smell get you. You'll get used to it. I never let it bother me. Tea then, and perhaps a muffin. Oh, mind the veins. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Two teas and muffins. Thank you. Cream, Kerry? No, thank you. Got any friends in London? No, I've not even seen to lodgings. Well, there's a room to let below me. It's right across from the hospital. I dare say you could get that. Well, I shall certainly inquire. You'll be, of course, pretty busy for the first three months. That's the biology exam, you know. But after that, there's lots to do in London. Oh, I'm afraid I'm not the social type. But the best I can do is the gallery at a music hall. Music hall? <laughs> there's bigger game than that. Here, now, take that girl, the waitress. She's uh, somewhat like, hmm? Which one? Oh. Oh, they wouldn't look at her in Paris. Too thin, she looks anemic, sort of sort of unhealthy. Oh, but what a ripping face. Let's get her over here, what? Seems to be quite busy with that German-looking chap, talking 16 to the dozen. Oh, I don't know. All I'd want is a lead. Her name's Mildred, I asked. Mildred? What an odious name. Why? I like it. Oh, it's so pretentious. I say, Carrie, here she comes. Give us a hand, will you? Well, but... I've uh, never uh, been able to talk to her. Do be a good chap. Well, I, I don't know. Go I... on, will you? Just a lead. Will there be anything else, gentlemen? <laughs> uh, we were waiting for you anxiously, uh, Mildred. I? I don't know what you mean. We can hardly wait for you to finish with the nobleman with the sandy moustaches. <laughs> right, Griffiths? <laughs> Some people would do better to mind their own business. I've got nothing to say to customers like you, and I don't want them to say nothing to me. If that's all, I'll get the bill. Oh, ho, ho, ho. there's one in the eye for you, Carrie. Pale-mannered baggage. You did get her back up, you know. I'm quite indifferent to the attitude of her vertebrae. All right, old man, calm down. Did you notice her skin? It's unhealthy, greenish. Here now, Carrie, come off it. She's only a waitress. <laughs> Will it be? Uh, tea, please. Tea. Right, sir. Something wrong? Eh? Hey? You're staring. Oh, oh, am I? Sorry. It's impolite, you know. Tea, eh? Oh, it's you again. Still busy with your German friend, eh? Look here now. I talk to who I wish. It's no concern of yours, you know. Tea? Uh, yes, uh, tea. You've been there again, eh, Kerry? What? Where? That tea shop. She got under your skin, huh? Well, that waitress. Oh, nonsense. Nonsense? Ha <laughs> ha. I can't understand it. I, 
I wish they hadn't said she'd say something really cheeky so that I could report her and get her sacked. She's so unspeakably vulgar. Vulgar and yet... Uh... Oh, well. At any rate, I shan't go there again. Oh, it's you. I thought you weren't coming. Busy cutting up, people. <laughs> Not as bad as that. You're a student, aren't you? Uh, yes. Oh. What's that paper? I didn't know you could draw. Oh, I was an art student for two years. Is it meant to be me? Yes. Hmm. Where's that young fellow that used to come in with you? Well, fancy you're remembering him. He was a nice-looking fellow. I, um... I say, I... I wonder if you'd dine with me one night and come to the new musical comedy. I, I'll get a couple of tickets. Let's see you asking me to the theatre. Well, do you want to go? I don't mind. That you, Kerry? Griffiths? Oh, you don't mind my barging in, eh, Kerry? The blasted grates caved in up in my room, cold enough to freeze the ink. Oh, that's all right. Oh? Something wrong? You look like a thundercloud. Where have you been? The theatre. Griffiths, I... I can't understand it. What? She, she's not pretty. Her, her mouth is thin, ugly. She, she's cheap and common. But she's so odiously genteel. A little finger sticking straight out when she drinks her. Her skin is sickly and greenish, with a pallor like those those blasted specimens on the slab of the hospital. And yet... And yet, heaven help me, I... Carrie. I'm... I'm not happy with her, but I... I can't stand being away. I... I lie awake at night thinking of that thin, awkward body and those pale, bloodless lips and... And heaven help me, I... I want to kiss them over and over. Oh, I say, Carrie, old chap, aren't you well? You haven't been in a lectures for over a week. The bio exam's coming up, you know. I don't know. I I can't seem to get at the books. I, I keep thinking of her. It cuts clear through me. Why, right now, right now, Griffiths, I'm I'm aching for her. I, I, I hate her. She she revolts me. She she nauseates me, and yet, Griffiths, I I love her. In early today, eh? The regular, I suppose. Um, uh, why don't you sit down? Nobody's wanting you just now. I don't mind if I do. <laughs> Where's your German friend with the moustache? I haven't seen him lately. Oh, he's gone back to Birmingham. He only, he only comes up to London every now and again. Is he in love with you? I don't know what it's got to do with you if he is. You don't set much store on me, do you? Why should I? I, uh, Mildred, you are going to the theatre with me tonight. You promised last week. Oh, I'm awfully sorry. I shan't be able to come after all. Why? Don't look so stern about it. I, uh, my aunt was taken ill last night. Oh. Well, I'll see you home then. You can't see me home. I've, uh, I've made other arrangements. I dare say. I saw you with Miller last night. What, you dirty little cat? Were you spying on me? I thought she was a gentleman. Did you think a gentleman would take any interest in you? Here now. Miller's taking you out this evening, isn't he? Well, I'd rather have him than you tagging after. And now perhaps you'd mind your own business in the future. Oh, I, I said, don't be beastly with me, Mildred. You know, I, I'm awfully fond of you. <laughs> I can't go on like this, Mildred. I can't study. I, I failed the first board examination. I keep thinking of you. Oh, you've got to come with me this evening. You're a funny fella. I can't make you out. It's very simple. I'm such a blasted fool that I... I love you with all my heart, and I... I know you don't care tuppence for me. Oh. Well, if you're a gentleman in every sense of the word, you'll beg my pardon. What? That was a very nasty trick spying on me. Well, you haven't begged my pardon yet. I... I... I'm very sorry, Mildred. I beg your pardon.
I say, Kerry. Kerry! The stage is that way, you know. Hey, what? You keep staring up at the gallery. In a music hall, one generally looks at the stage. She's up there now, with Miller. See, by the second column. She went tonight with him. Oh, come on, Grippers, let's go home. <laughs> there you stuck yourself, didn't you? What the devil? That comes a put in your arm where it's got no business to be. That pin always catches them when they try putting an arm around my waist. Mildred, I can't go on this way. I, I've got to know. I know. We're off again, eh? Always asking me if I love you over and over and over. Well, I can't help it. Well, if you really loved me, you'd ask me to marry you. I shan't be earning a penny for six years till I've qualified as a doctor. You've got some money, haven't you? Fourteen hundred pounds. But I've got to keep myself on that. But they say two can live as cheap as... That would be four pounds a week. Three. I've got my fees to pay. <laughs> well, you needn't worry, because I wouldn't marry you if you went down on your bended knees to me. Well, of all the bloody cheek... I wish you wouldn't use bad language when you speak to me, Philip. You know I don't like it. If I had an ounce of sense, I'd never see you again. If you only knew how I despise myself for loving you. Well, that's fine, isn't it? Because, you see, I'm going to get married. Are you? I'm 24 and it's time I settle down. You might congratulate me. I might. Well, who are you to marry? Miller. He makes seven pounds a week now. And he's got prospects. I know. You were bound to accept the highest bidder. Well, when does it take place? Saturday next. I've already given notice at the tea shop. I'm tired. I'm going home to bed now. But, Philip... Driver, stop here and then take the young lady to Victoria Station. But won't you come up with me? It's not proper to leave... We'll make a full stop now, Mildred. I don't see why I should go on making myself unhappy. Goodbye. But, Philip... What? Oh, don't worry. I've paid for the cab. Carrie, come on upstairs, will you? I've got someone to meet you here. Oh, I can't be bothered. Well, what are you up to? Studying. I've got six months' work to wake up. Oh, be a good chap, Griffiths, and dash off. What's come over you? I'm free, Griffiths. Free! She's off to be married, and I'm free. That girl, huh? But you know, I've even tried to think of her, and I can't. <laughs> now, do be a good chap and be off. But I, I've got somebody upstairs for you to meet, and I promised. Well, I... Oh, I... come along, Kerry. Those books will keep. Anyway, it's time for tea. And I want you to meet Nora. <laughs> Oh, that's silly, Mr. Carey. <laughs> oh, no, it isn't. You'd make an admirable painting. Your face has character, you know. You mean wrinkles. That's what I get for earning a living instead of being supported as a lady ought. <laughs> what are you doing now, Nora? <laughs> Writing those penny novelettes. They pay 15 pounds a piece, and it's just the same thing over and over with the names changed. Then, every once and again, I get a walk-on role in some theatrical spectacle. I manage. I think you do wonderfully. <laughs> oh, so long as I have the rent and a pound or two for food, I don't worry. Well, gentlemen... Are you taking me out to dine? Uh, I don't think I can. Oh, don't, since you must come along, Mr. Carey. And you shall see me home. It's my birthday today, and I insist on having my own way. <laughs> and I was dreadfully in love with her. You know, I... I can't imagine why I've told you the whole story. Well, I think you're well out of it. Poor thing, you must have had a rotten time. I, I'm so grateful to you for being so nice to me. I like you so much. <laughs> Don't be idiotic. <laughs> I say, may I? Why did you do that? <laughs> because it's so, so comfortable to kiss you. <laughs> you know, it's awfully silly of you to behave like this. I've only just met you. We could be such jolly friends. Well, if you really want to appeal to my better nature, you'll do well not to stroke my cheek while you're doing it. <laughs> it's 
very wrong of me, isn't it? Nora, you're not fond of me, are you? You ask rather dull questions for a clever boy. Oh, oh it, it never struck me that you could be. Oh, Nora. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm dead. Why? I, I'm so surprised. And pleased. Delighted and, and so proud and so happy and, and so grateful. Oh, Nora, it, it's like waking out of a, a horrible, degrading dream. I, I'm so terribly happy. Now, Philip, don't. You must get back to your books. Oh, I can't work any more now. You've got to pass the next examination. You failed it once already. Ah, but that was before you. <laughs> Perhaps you'd better go down to your uncle's at Blackstable to study. Why? Are you tired of me? <laughs> no, silly. Because you've been working hard and you look utterly washed out. You want some fresh air. Rest. You know, I wouldn't believe anyone else who said that. Nora, I wonder what you see in me. Will you give me a good character with my month's notice? I'll say that you're thoughtful and kind. Oh, that's all nonsense, dear. But I will tell you one thing. I'm one of the few people I've ever met who are able to learn from experience. Well, that's all there was to it, Kerry. McAllister tipped me off. I bought the stock then. I sold it when he said to, and there I was. Fifty guineas to the good. Wish I'd known, Harry. I'm running rather low, and I'm frightfully keen on raising a few pounds myself. Well, here we are. Oh, are you stopping at the rooms? Yeah, I'm expecting Nora for lunch. Well, I shall have to be off to the hospital. Goodbye, Kerry. See you for supper. <laughs> Philip! Philip! Mildred, what the devil do you want? I didn't think I'd see you again. Well? It's Emil. He's gone and left me. Miller ran off, eh? I... Well, you better sit down. I wish I'd married you when you asked me. Tell me, what's happened? Well, last Monday week he went up to Birmingham and I didn't hear from him for a week. I wrote him. And this morning I got a solicitor's letter saying I had no legal claim on him. But that's absurd. A man can't treat his wife that way. He was frightened because I told him a baby was coming. He said it was my fault. I found out precious quick he wasn't a gentleman. I wouldn't go back to him now. Not if he was coming to ask me on his bended knees. But he's got to provide for you. You ought to see a solicitor. Uh, I could let you have some money now. You are good to me, Philip. Are you fond of me still? I love you, Mildred. I suppose I always did. Philip, you're a gentleman in every sense of the word. In every sense of the word. <laughs> Quiet today, Philip. Something wrong? Huh? <laughs> say something nice to me. What shall I say? Mm, might, by an effort of the imagination, say that you uh, rather liked me. Nora, I, um, I shan't be able to be with you tomorrow. But I've asked the Gordons to lunch. They'll be disappointed. Where will you be? I, I don't like to be forced to account for all my movements. Philip. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Nora. <laughs> You're your own master, I suppose. I don't want you to do anything you don't want to. Maybe, Nora... Maybe we'd better leave it at that. What? The whole thing's over. You... you mean you don't love me anymore? I'm afraid so. I, I can't help it, really. <laughs> oh, I... I'm awfully sorry to hurt you. It... It's not my fault that I don't love you. I know. I can't help myself, really. Mildred's come back. Oh, Will you call me a cab? I, I don't feel I can walk. I'll drive back with you if you like. I, I hope you'll forgive me, Nora. Poor fellow, you, you're quite worried about me. You mustn't bother. Oh, Nora. I, I don't I... blame you. I shall get over it. <laughs> Mildred, 
Another five pounds? I don't really know where the money goes to. It just slips through my fingers like water. And I'll have to make arrangements for someone to look after the baby for seven and sixpence a week. Do you mean farm the child out? It's all very fine to look shocked, but it's jolly difficult for a girl to earn a living by herself when she's got a baby tagging after. I'm glad it's over, and I don't mean to let the little wretch tie me down. Perhaps I can beat him down to six and sixpence. Oh, for heaven's sakes, don't haggle over the price. I'd rather pay half a guinea a week than run the risk of the kid being starved or beaten. (laughs) You are a funny old thing, Philip. I know. Well, are we going somewhere tonight? Tonight? I've been stuck in that old lodging house just about long enough. I want to see people, have a good time. Oh, I thought we might be alone together. Ah, oh, that's so dull. Do let's have a dinner party, Philip. Is that friend of yours still about? The student? Griffiths? I suppose he would amuse you. Well, all right, Mildred. I'll get tickets for a musical comedy. Oh, you are good to me, aren't you, Phil? You are a funny fellow. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. Phil, isn't that the funniest thing? Mr. Griffiths, you're a real armor. Why, you must call me Harry. After all, I've never heard Philip call you anything but Mildred. I say, Kerry, is that all right? No, of course. Hadn't we better be going, Mildred? So soon? I haven't had such a time in ages. It's early, isn't it, Harry? Well, I... No, I think we'd better go. It's a rotten show anyway. Can't think what you both see in it. What the devil's been eating you tonight, Kerry? Are you in love with Mildred? I? <laughs> Oh, is that it? Of course not. It doesn't matter to you, Harry. You, you've got so many women. Oh, don't take her away from me. It means my whole life. I, I've been so awfully wretched. Oh, my dear boy, if I'd known you were going to take it like that, I'd have been more careful. Is that true? I don't care tuppence for her, old boy. I give you my word of honor. Oh, Harry, I, I feel so miserable, so so confounded and degraded. But she's all I've got. I, I've got to hold on to her. Well, you were flirting quite with Griffiths last night. Did you have a good time? <laughs> I adore him, Philip. I'm quite in love with him. Huh. Well, I'm glad to know that he's not in love with you. How do you know? I asked him. Oh? Then would you like to read a letter I received from him this morning? What? He's asked me to go off with him. No. I rather love him, I think. I can't help it. No, Mildred, no, you can't. I... I've waited so. I, I've paid for everything. I, I'm paying for the keep of your baby. I've paid for every stitch that you've got on now. If you was a gentleman, you wouldn't keep throwing it at oh, me. Oh, for heaven's sake, shut up. If I were a gentleman, I wouldn't waste my time on a vulgar drab like you. What? Listen here, I never liked you from the beginning. You forced yourself on me. I always hated it when you kissed me. I'm going off with Griffiths here. I wouldn't let you touch me now, not if I was starved. Well, you will be. Griffiths owes me seven pounds, and he's just pawned his microscope. I don't care. It's hard, isn't it? Oh, fancy anybody <laughs> wanting to be in love. Ow. Oh, here, here. I'll lend you ten pounds. Oh, Phil. Take it. Take it and go with Griffiths. You are a gentleman in every sense of the word, aren't you? A gentleman. Go on, Mildred, go. Go on, get out. I'll be here if you... if you want me when you come back. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is presenting Brian Ahern and Angela Lansbury in our adaptation of the Somerset Mom novel of Human Bondage, the eighth in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern British and American authors. Information on how to obtain free materials on the authors and books presented in this series will be given at the close of the program. 
Now, here to discuss the Somerset Maugham work is our intermission commentator, the distinguished author, lecturer, and critic, Mr. Clifton Fadiman, speaking to you from New York. Our human bondage occupies a peculiar position in Somerset Maugham's career and also in modern literature in general. It appeared quite a long time ago, in 1915. And although Maugham at that time had already acquired a certain reputation, this novel, now considered a classic, fell flat. Its virtues, the virtues of truth, sincerity, and gravity, seem perfectly apparent to us now. But it would seem that they were not so apparent then. The book was more or less of a failure. Nevertheless, it refused to die. It enjoyed a kind of underground reputation for some years, was rediscovered several times in the 20s, and at last slowly worked its way into a kind of contemporary immortality. Its position in Maugham's own career is equally curious. He's written perhaps, so oh, 40 or so books, but no one of them, even cakes and ale, is comparable to of human bondage. Many are interesting and skillful, but no one of them has the tremendous emotional drive the heartfelt sincerity, the broad and sober humanity of this tale of the young man's awakening to the complexity of the world and to the agony of love. Of Human Bondage was the perfect, almost accidental product of certain special pressures in Maugham's own personal life, pressures that were never again repeated. It's quite largely autobiographical. Like Philip Carey, Maugham himself at first studied to be a doctor, though he never actually practiced. And like Philip, he spent some years in Paris, amid precisely the bohemian society so graphically portrayed in the novel. And like Philip, Maugham himself suffered from a physical disability. In his youth and young manhood, he was afflicted with a distressing stammer, just as Philip had to overcome the pain and difficulty of a club foot. This novel bears in solution Maugham's own personality before it gelled and settled into the man-of-the-world figure with which his later work has familiarized us. It has a sincerity, a passion that was never to reappear, just as it contains many crudities that the older Maugham has softened and refined. As a study of a superior man's obsession for an inferior woman, it's probably unsurpassed in the English language. Mildred is one of the great female characters in the history of the novel, like Emma Bovary or Becky Sharp. The relation between her and poor Philip is exposed with such pity and penetration as to enable this novel to bear with dignity the weight of its superb tragic title. This is quite truly a narrative of human bondage, of the bondage that all of us feel in one way or another, bondage to another human being, to a false idea, or merely to the sad, insoluble, puzzling tangle of modern life itself. Thank you, Mr. Fadiman. Our dramatization of Somerset Maugham's Of Human Bondage, starring Brian O'Hearn and Angela Lansbury, continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. The cold, wet London months went by. Philip gave his landlady notice and moved his lodgings to a cheaper district. He tried to drive his mind faster, to make up the long months of studying he'd ignored. And then, when spring lifted a cold siege of the winter months, he made his way up the familiar stairs to the garret flat where he had laughed and been happy with Nora. Philip. Philip, come in. Hello, Nora. Sit down. Oh, I've just poured tea. Do have a cup. Uh, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's awfully jolly to be sitting in this room again. You don't know how I've missed it. Why on earth didn't you come before? I was afraid to. You needn't have been. I've treated you awfully badly. I, I'm dreadfully ashamed of myself. Mildred's gone. She's gone off with Griffiths now. I haven't heard at all. Oh. I've thought so much of your kindness. I was happy with you, Nora. I... I should have stuck with you. I, I didn't know how, how wonderful you were. I've been such a fool. I'm afraid you've had a rotten time. 
I'm dreadfully sorry. Philippa. Yes? I'm engaged to be married. Charlie Kingsford, the journalist, you know. Oh. Uh, wish I hadn't made such a fool of myself. I'm sorry. You were never really in love with me. It's not very pleasant, being in love. <laughs> well, it's a good joke on me, you know. <laughs> very good. Philip. <laughs> but it's not very comfortable to have the gift of being amused at one's own absurdity. I... Uh, well, goodbye, Nora. I say there, Kerry. Kerry! There's no sense you cutting me, you know. Oh, please. I've been looking for you. All over the hospital. I did want to be friends again. Oh, let go my arm, Griffiths. Oh, I wish to heaven I'd never seen that woman. Do you... Do you know where Mildred is now? Thank heaven, no. If I'd known she was going to be so devilishly hard to get rid of, I wouldn't have bothered in the first place. I say, Kerry, don't go. Yeah, Griffiths, I don't want to talk to you, and I don't see why I should. But I, I, I say... I want it on the ward. Now, now, let me alone. <laughs> Get those prehensile, preadamite claws off me, you please, little Please, now. Or aren't they, witch? Foul hag of innocence. Here, now, you can't pull me back. Here, here, here. What's all the noise? Oh, doctor. This here patient's cutting up real fancy. Be gone, Mephisto's all daughter. Right, all right, I'll take care of it. No, 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 no. What's wrong? That foul-faced fiend was about to confiscate my book. Oh, <laughs> well, let's see your chart. Hmm. Thorpe Athelney, eh? Journalist. Of sorts. Huh? What sorts? Advertisements for Linen Sedley, Linen Draper. Oh, that's an odd name, Athelney. It's old Yorkshire. He used to be quite an estate generations back. But the mighty have fallen. Fast women and slow horses. Rather surprised to see you in the ward? I mean... No, my principle is to profit by every benefit society provides. I have no false shame. I come to the hospital ward to be patched up, and I send my children to board school. Do you really? And a capital education they get, too. Much better than I got at Eton. I've got nine, you know. Huh. You must come and see them when I get home again. I've taken a fancy to you. You will come, eh? Well, there I, now, it's settled. I... We shall expect you Sunday week. There you are, Mr. Carey. And that table brought all the way from Spain. Took a month's salary, but it was worth it. It's teakwood. Yeah, it's exceedingly handsome. Indeed. I believe in living the old ways. It is my theory that people in those days got Father, more... Of... Mother says you're to stop talking. Dinner's ready, and I'm to bring it in when you sit down. Oh, come and shake hands with Mr. Carey. Isn't she enormous? She's my eldest. Oh, come on, Father. Sit down at the table. Well, uh, won't we wait for Mrs. Athelney? I always have meals by myself. I don't think women ought to sit at table with men. It puts ideas in their heads. And women are never at ease with themselves when they have ideas. Now then, what's first, Sally? The Yorkshire pudding, Father. Uh, and you've never tasted anything like it. You see, it's an advantage I have. My wife isn't a lady, which guarantees the cooking. <clears throat> now, a jug of beer now, Sally, to top off the feast. Oh, well, I'll have to run out for it, Father. Hmm, let's see, uh, that sixpence here somewhere. Tell me, Kerry, did you ever see such a handsome strapping girl? It'll be a lucky swain who gets you, eh, Sally? <laughs> I shudder to think what will happen when she puts her hair up, eh? <laughs> Do stop talking, Father, or the dinner will get cold. Right you are. Roast beef, Mr. Kerry? Ah, never marry a lady, my boy. Roast beef in Yorkshire pudding for Sunday dinner. That's what I've taught Sally she's to do when she's married, right? Yes, Father. You call when you're ready for cheese. Well, Carrie, it's been a jolly evening. I'm afraid I'm coming to see you too often. <laughs> Nonsense. The door is always open. Oh, but every Sunday. Ah. <laughs> well, I've got to leave you now. Next Sunday, eh, Philip? Well, uh, certainly. I, I should love to. Remember then, come early. The children seem to like it immensely. Goodbye now. Mind your way, the fog. Goodbye. 
Go on, get about your business. Here now. Go on now. All oh, right, if you're made to be nasty. Good Lord. What? Mildred. That's his Mildred. Oh, this is awful. I- is there anywhere we can go and talk? I don't want to talk. Leave me alone. I, I've got a couple of sovereigns if you're that hard up. I don't know what you mean. I'm, I'm just on my way home to my lodgings. I was, I was going to meet a girl. For heaven's sake, don't lie now. <laughs> come along, come along. There's a bobby coming. We've got to move on. Mildred, it's awful. You don't think I like living this way. Anyway, I, I should think you'd be pleased. Where's the baby? I've got her with me in London. I don't have the money to keep her on at Brighton. Well, wouldn't they take you back at the shop? Well, I walked my legs off looking for work. Why didn't you write to me? I didn't like to, not after what happened. Anyway, I thought you'd just say I got what I deserved. You don't know me very well, do you? Even now. You mean you still care for me, Philip? No, I, I'm over it. I'm sorry for you now. Oh, you are a gentleman in every sense of the word. You're the only one I ever met. I hate asking you, Philip, but can you spare me anything? I've only got two pounds on me. My money's almost gone, Mildred. I'll pay you back. What will you do now? I wish I was dead. Look here. If you really want to get away from it, I've got an extra room you could clean up for me and cook. I don't suppose the baby eats much. You mean to say you take me back after all that's happened? I don't want you to mistake me. I'm just giving you a room in exchange for your cleaning up. Do you understand? Oh, Philip, you are so good to oh, me. Come along now, it's late, and I've got to be up early in the morning. More meat? You're very silent tonight, Mildred. I'm paid to cook and clean. I didn't know I was expected to talk oh, as what well. What the devil's wrong now? You haven't been nice to me all week. Mildred, I thought we had that settled. I'm over that. I don't love you any more. Well, I'm not the one to go down on my hands and knees. Then what do you want? You're not in love with me. Me? Not likely. And you can't say you're of a passionate nature. So what in heaven's name is bothering it's you? It's so humiliating. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mildred. I might be poisonous. Now, now, let's not have a scene. You asked me to marry you once. Oh, please, Mildred. Why are you so horrid Don't to me, talk Phil? talk rot. It isn't rot. I do love you, Phil, really. I want to make up for all the harm I did you. I can't go on like this. It's not in human nature. I loved you too much, Mildred. I, I wore the passion out. I can't look at you now without thinking of Miller and Griffiths and... Philip. Don't be such an old silly. Oh, Mildred. It's just like old times, isn't it, Philip? Mildred, isn't let it? Let go, let go. You, you, you disgust me. Me? I disgust you. You loathsome, foul, dirty, nasty. I've never cared for you. Not once I was making a fool of you always. You bored me. You bored me still. Mildred. I would never have let you touch me only for the money. It made me sick when you kissed me. You laughed at me. Griffiths and me, we laughed at you. We laughed at you because you were such a mug. A mug, a mug. You, you, you cripple. I say, Kerry, don't go off now. Well, I suppose there's no reason to, Griffiths. I've been looking for you. Do you remember that flutter you had with my stockbroker, pal? Of course. Well? Well, the fact is, I... I, I mean, what were the, the, the boars holding out so long? Well, you see, it, it, it seems that... You mean I'm wiped out, eh? MacAllister asked if you could put up some more security. <laughs> my friend, I've just pawned my other suit, and I'm to be tossed out of my lodgings on Saturday week. You mean you're stony? Well, how'll you go on at the medical school? I shan't. I'm on my way now to look for work. There's only one thing wrong. Yes? There isn't any... What's this? What? What? Oh. Now, now, you can't sleep in the embankment. Up now. All right. All right, I, I'm going. That's a good chap. Now, you move on, see, and stay moved on. I don't want no vagrancy in my beat. But I... I no I, more I... nonsense now. Move on. Hello. 
Philip, where have you been? I, uh, I've been away. You have, eh? Sally, set the kettle on. Philip's here. Now, come inside. Oh, Mr. Carey, we've missed you these Sundays. Oh. Sally, we'll have dinner immediately, eh? Uh, <clears throat> I'm exceedingly hungry. Oh, yes, Father. Won't you have an egg and a glass of milk while you're waiting, Mr. Carey? Uh, no, no, I... I'm all right. Certainly you are. Here, sit down. <laughs> What's happened since I saw you last, Sally? Nothing that I know of. Nothing? <laughs> that hussy taunts me with the fact that a gentleman who sells gents' collars has made her an offer of marriage. <laughs> <coughs> and have you <coughs> accepted him, Sally? <laughs> oh, you should know father better than that. There is no word of truth in it. <laughs> now sit down, both of you. I'll have dinner out in a moment. Smoke? Have a tuppenny sticker. I, I don't think I'd better. Hmm? Now, see here, Philip. I wrote you a letter last week, and I was around to your rooms Wednesday. Where have you been sleeping all this week? Nowhere. Well, why didn't you come here? We've been just as broke in our day, only we had babies to look after. It seems ridiculous, but I believe I'm going to cry. Nonsense. I, uh, I believe there's a chance of you getting some work at my shop. We're advertising for a shop walker. Six bob a week with food and lodging. Here you are, Father. Roast beef and pudding. Capital. Sally, Mr. Carey's coming to live with us. Oh, that's nice. I'll go and get the spare bed ready. Gentlemen's collar, sir, second to the left. Yes, madam. Uh, ladies' bonnets, first right. Uh, sheets and cases, they'll be on the third floor front, please. Curtains, madam, third turning to the left. <laughs> and you're to be promoted, eh, Philip? <laughs> no more money, though, never fear. The manager found out I was an art student once, and he set me to designing the custom clothes. Hmm. A lowering of the divine metier of Giotto and El Greco, but twill serve. Ooh! Something wrong? Uh, there's a letter for you. The boy brought it round from the hospital. Oh, well, thank you. Hmm. Nothing wrong, I trust? Uh, I, I shall have to make a call. I wish to heaven that letter hadn't come. <laughs> Philip. Oh, I suppose she was surprised to hear from me. What do you want? A doctor. Then I'm no use to you. I'm no longer at the hospital. How's that? I had to give it up a year and a half ago. Couldn't afford to go on with my training. Oh, you, you not forgot your doctoring? No, not entirely. Because that's why I wanted to see you, Philip. You're ill? Philip, you will look at me. If you wish. Please, Philip. I'm, I'm frightened. What are you complaining of? Well, it's a rash. I broke an heart. I can't get rid of it. Philip, I'm afraid. I, I couldn't stand going to the hospital. You were the only one I could turn to, Philip. This rash, it's terrible. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mildred, don't get hysterical. Now, let's have a look at you. Can you tell, Phil? Is it... Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let me look at your throat. Wider. Mildred, I'm afraid you're very ill. Very ill indeed. Philip, no. What did you expect? Oh, well, I had to live somehow. What was I to do? Really, Mildred, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> oh. Have you any money? Six or seven pounds. You must give up this life, you know. Don't you think you could get some work? What is there I could do now? Well, I can't help you now. I only make six bob a week. Don't be downhearted. Oh, oh. Don't leave me. I'm so afraid. Don't go yet, Phil. There's no one else I can go to. Mildred, you've come back twice, and twice you... Oh, I know. I've treated you shocking, but don't leave me alone now. Oh, you've had your revenge. For heaven's sake, Mildred. You know baby died last summer. Oh. You might say you were sorry. Oh, I'm not. It's best for the child. Look, Mildred, I'll get you the medicine, and you ought to take it, mind. And then you've got to get some honest work. 
or I'll learn my lesson, Phil. No more racketing around for yours truly. I won't go back to it, not me. Mildred. What? Oh, it's you. I waited outside. Where are you going, Mildred? Oh, 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 oh I was just going in to see the show. Down Marbury Lane? <laughs> Not likely. Why, well, well, I can't sit home alone all the time, can I? Mildred, I just warned you. You're not fooling me. I'm not blind. I told you over and over how dangerous it is. You're sick. You've got to stop this sort of thing at once. Oh, hold your jaw. How do you suppose I'm going to live? Let me take you back home. You don't know what you're doing. It's criminal. What do I care? Men haven't been so good to me that I need bother my head about them. Let go my arm, Philip. Mildred. Let go! I can't do anything more. That's the end. Now, Philip, swallow your tea. You'll be late for the shop. Not today. I'm chucking it. Quitting. What? I got the solicitor's letter this morning. My uncle's gone, and the auction of his goods will clear my fees at the medical school. What? Splendid. Then you've got less than a year to qualify. Betty, Sally, break out a bottle of the shilling port. We've a celebration. Our Philip's going back to his doctoring. What's ever wrong, Father? The world is turning up again. Sally, you must kiss Philip to celebrate his good fortune. Oh, I'm not. I don't like being kissed by men. Huh. Ungrateful hussy. Well, the wine will have to do. We'll drink to Dr. Philip Carey. Mr. Carey. Eh? Oh, Sally. You you didn't think it disagreeable of me not to kiss you last week at the celebration, the way Father wanted me to? Oh, not a bit. Oh. Well, go on reading. I just thought as you were alone, I'd come and sit with you. You know, you're the most silent person I've ever struck. <laughs> we don't want another who's talkative in this house. Father does nicely. <laughs> so you're the new assistant, eh? Yes, sir. Got a club foot, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, don't stammer about it. Nothing wrong. Uh, you're not a university man, are you? No, sir. Good. They are too blasted gentlemanly for me. Uh, very well, you'll do. Uh, breakfast at 8.30. Well, Carrie, it's been six months, eh? Yes, sir. I'm leaving Tuesday week. Hmm, that's so. Uh, look here. Why not stay? Sir? I'm offering you a partnership. Why? I like you. Well, what do you say? The practice brings around 700 a year, and when I die, you can succeed me. That's better than knocking about the hospitals. I, I, I don't think I can. I, I've had a roughish time, and... I, and I want to get away. I think I'll try for a position on a tramp steamer. I want to see Spain and, and, and the South Seas. And, oh, I have a sort of ache for places I've never been. At any rate, I, I mean to leave England. Mm, going to tramp about, eh? Well, if you change your mind, wire me. I'll give you one month. One month to the day. <laughs> How's the work, Philip? We've all been dying to know. Eh, Sally? Oh, it's not too bad. Dr. South's offered me a partnership. Oh, how wonderful. But I've, I've turned him down. I'm set on traveling now. I'm sick of the things and places I know. I don't want to work on the same old hacking coughs year in and year out. Splendid. Off to the South Seas. That's a spirit. Right, Sally? If you say so, Father. But I don't see anything wrong with England. <laughs> no, not this part of it anyway. We always spend two weeks down here in Kent harvesting the hop fields. It pays its own way, and it's a delightful holiday. 
Here now, Sally, you take Philip off and uh, show him how hops are picked. Get on now. It's picked for your supper out here. <laughs> so you don't approve of my traveling, eh, Sally? No, I don't. I'd much rather have you stay about. Oh, would you really? Oh, never mind that now. We've got to get to the picking. You see, Mr. Carey, you sort of tickle the blossoms off. It wants soft hands. Oh, you pick them so easily. Oh, you be careful, though. A doctor doesn't want to bruise his hands, does he? You do like to take care of people, don't you? I've always liked you. Well, I didn't know that. I knew. That day you came when you didn't have anything to eat. Oh, I say, uh, how can you? I'm, I'm insignificant and, and crippled and, and ordinary and ugly. Oh, you're no silly. That's what you are. Should you like to kiss me now? I think so. How old are you, Sally? Nineteen. You seem ever so much older than that. <laughs> Father calls me a Saxon temperament, but then he's always predicting I shall grow fat. Father thinks a great deal of you. Sally, might I kiss you again? Well, perhaps we'd best take a walk after dinner. If we don't pick any hops this afternoon, well, it, <laughs> it will look awfully funny. been awfully quiet, Philip. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I say anything, I shall ask you to marry me. Oh, but what about your plans to travel? Heaven knows you were frightfully keen on the South Seas. I, I don't know. Sally, I, I've been starved for beauty. And I fancy I thought that I'd have to go to the ends of the earth to find it. Well, now I, I don't think I have to. Yes. I've been in love, you know. But it was ugly and I... I didn't want it again. But it's... It's changed. I... <laughs> oh, enough of talking. Sally, you will marry me? If you like. Well, don't you want to? It's about time I settled down. Oh, but you don't want to marry me. Oh, there's no one else I would marry. <laughs> then oh. that settles it. <laughs> oh, Sally. People aren't ugly anymore. Everybody has some deformity, I suppose, a, a weakness, a sickness, a body or mind. They can't help themselves. But you've got to accept the good in them, you know, and, and be patient with their faults. And... Phil, dear. Yes? You've talked enough now. It's time to go back home. <laughs> The curtain of the NBC University Theater falls on our dramatization of the Somerset Mom novel of Human Bondage, the eighth in this series of radio plays based on outstanding works in modern Anglo-American fiction. The radio adaptation was by Ernest Kenoy. Our intermission commentator was Mr. Clifton Fadiman. Our stars were Brian Ahern, now being seen in Smart Woman with Constance Bennett, and Angela Lansbury, who is currently starred with Lana Turner, Gene Kelly, and June Allison, in Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Technicolor production, The Three Musketeers. Our cast included Eric Snowden, Dan O'Herlihy, Monty Margetts, Donald Morrison, Constance Cavendish, and Alec Harford. Next week at this time, the NBC University Theater turns to the work of Ernest Hemingway as we present our dramatization of his famous story, The Short Happy Life of Francis McComber. <laughs> Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with college home study courses in Anglo-American fiction under NBC's National College by Radio plan. This plan permits NBC listeners to obtain college-supervised, organized education at home by means of radio listening and supplementary study. 
For full information about the authors and how to take advantage of this home study plan, which is currently being developed at the University of Louisville and elsewhere, send a penny postcard to College by Radio Courses, National Broadcasting Company, New York 20, New York. Your director was Andrew C. Love. Original music for Of Human Bondage was composed by Albert Harris and conducted by Henry Russell. This program came to you from Hollywood. Your entertainment problem is solved tonight because there are two and a half hours of great comedy ahead. Five of the funniest shows in radio. Shows like Ozzie and Harriet, the one and only Jack Benny, Phil Harris and Alice Faye, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, and then Fred Allen. Listen and laugh straight through. For the best time of your life, the time is tonight on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Welcome back. Well, I've never heard Angela Lansbury before in a Cockney working class role. But I think she did a really uh, solid job. And Mildred is kind of on this whole downward spiral. Although even from the start, she's never actually all that kind to Brian A. Hearn's character. And it has to be said that she doesn't really force herself on him or force herself into his life, he keeps bringing her back in, except for the last time, and there she just really needs uh, a medical diagnosis from him, which he provides. I was glad that by the time we got to the third time around, he was pretty clear that he wasn't in love with her anymore, and was just, you know, providing her an opportunity to work and get room and board. Because I was really struggling to respect him throughout most of the story. Just because he kept making all of these, you know, really horrible decisions. I thought, you know, leaving uh, Nora was really dumb. But I think that what makes it work isn't that the character is particularly wise or commonsensical, but that he is... Uh, a realistic character, and even if his, you know, overall awareness and view of uh, Mildred, you know, the idea that he detests himself for loving her, that seemed a little over the top. But I think there are people who have gotten into some dumb or dangerous uh, patterns in relationships, and figured out that maybe it's not a good idea to just keep nurturing and returning to the most toxic relationship ever. And so the fact that he grows over the course of the story really makes it work. Plus, I think that a lot of the uh, secondary characters are pretty enjoyable. So overall, I found this to be a a uh, well-spent hour, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. And we'll have another episode of the NBC uh, University of the Air next week, which will, of course, feature Angela Lansbury. Well, that will do it for today. If you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.